the Bajan. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, as we turn now to Donald Trump. It's not been easy for me. It has not been easy for me. And, you know, I, I started off in Brooklyn. My father gave me a small loan of a million dollars. I came into Manhattan, and I had to pay him back, and I had to pay him back with interest. But I came into Manhattan, I started buying up properties, and I did great. And then I built the Grand Hyatt, and I got involved with the convention. So I did a good job. But I was always told that that would never work. Even my father, he said, you don't want to go to Manhattan. That's not our territory, because he was from Brooklyn and Queens, where we did, you know, smaller things. And he said, don't go to Manhattan. That's not our territory. But he was very proud of me. But all my life, I was told, no. Those were the words of presumptive Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump during a town hall event last year in New Hampshire. Well, today we look back at Trump's rise to power and how he profited from his father's deep pocketbook and political connections. Decades before Donald Trump became a household name, his father, Fred Trump, emerged as one of New York's most prolific real estate developers, building more than 27,000 homes in Brooklyn and Queens. In 1927, Fred Trump made news when he was arrested at a Ku Klux Klan riot in Queens. Earlier this week, Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez and I spoke with Wayne Barrett, considered the preeminent journalist on Donald Trump. As a reporter at The Village Voice, Barrett began reporting on Donald Trump in the late 70s. Barrett's 1991 biography of Donald Trump was just republished as an e-book with the title, Trump, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Deals, The Downfall, The Reinvention. We spoke to Wayne Barrett at his home in Brooklyn, where he's largely been confined due to his battle with lung cancer. I began by asking Wayne Barrett why he's tracked Donald Trump for so long. When I started in the 70s, he was this golden boy, you know, and uh, he had not had much press, but it had all been very supportive because he was doing the Grand Hyatt, which was his first big project in Manhattan. And the city was down in the dumps, you know, near broke uh, during the 70s. And he, he looked like the embodiment of a rising city. Uh, and he was getting that kind of press, though not much of it. And I was at the Village Voice. And um, so I took on uh, on, I was a rookie. He was a rookie. We were, we're about the same age. I'm a little older. And uh, so I, 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 I took on this whole notion of, well, let's take a look at this guy who appears to be uh, the answer to the city's uh, very grave financial problems at the time. And uh, I started working on him in the maybe 77 period. I worked on him intensely in 78, while the Hyatt was under construction, had not completed yet. And uh, that's when I first got to know him. And I did about 10 hours of taped interviews with him as a young guy and wrote a, a two-part series <clears throat> that led to the impaneling of a federal grand jury, actually, and uh, because he was engaged in all kinds of machinations, even as a, as a rookie. I mean, he started out playing games. So uh, uh, there was a federal grand jury here in the Eastern District in Brooklyn that uh, did not lead to an indictment, but may have been the toughest ride he's ever had, really, with a prosecutor. Now, one of the points that you made in the original book was the, the, the amount of um, uh, he's always been projected himself as a self-made millionaire and then billionaire, but the amount of support he got from his father, uh, also a real estate developer, and that his father was really crucial to his rise. Unbelievably crucial. When he opened his first office in Manhattan, the rent was paid by his father's company out here on Avenue Z in Brooklyn. And uh, everything that he did, whether it be the Grand Hyatt, the Grand Hyatt, for example, to get the financing, he got the financing from two banks that his father had used, used his father's relationship banker, and the father had to sign the financing agreements. I mean, they're not going to give a 30-year-old kid $35 million in 1978 to build a hotel. It has to be done with Fred's resources, and Fred Trump was a great outer borough builder and really built good housing, 20,000 units totally, all over Queens, all over Brooklyn, some of them towers like Trump Village, many of them single-family homes. 
uh, that uh, he had a great reputation as a builder. He was as politically wired as his son was. I mean, they played the political game, both of them, expertly. But Fred Trump was indispensable. I mean, even Trump Tower, which comes along later in Donald's career, could not have been done without Fred coming in and supporting the financing of it when he opened his first casino in Atlantic City, when he, when he bought the first properties, the leaseholds for the first properties for Trump Plaza, his casino in Atlantic City. Fred rode down in the limo with him and signed all the leasehold documents. Nobody was going to be financing this kid developer, kid casino operator. It was Fred who was the key to all of it. it it's so ridiculous for him to call himself a self-made guy when Fred's was critical at the political end, too. I mean, everything that came to Donald came through political connections, and they were political connections forged by his father over decades with Brooklyn uh, politicians. He came from the same political club as the then mayor of New York, Abe Beam. And when they he had to get an option for the Grand Hyatt and for the West Side Yards, from a bankrupt railroad in Philadelphia, Penn Central, and the, they, the people who were selling the assets of the bankrupt railroad wanted to make sure that the option that they gave, they were giving it to a developer who would actually develop, because that's when the real payment comes to the railroad. And so they came up from Philadelphia, and Fred Trump greets them, and Fred and Donald get them in a limo and take them down to City Hall, and there's a beam standing on the steps of City Hall Anything you want, we'll give you. So this is totally a byproduct of Fred's relationship. I wanted to ask you, you've, in the book, you refer to both of them, both Fred and Donald, as state capitalists. Uh, you yeah. talk about the political collection, con connections and the degree to which they depended on government officials or uh, politically connected leaders uh, to build their empire. Yeah, well, that's the irony of this current run. Um, I interviewed a guy named Joe Sharkey from the book, and this is not actually in the book because I'm not in the book, but I, I don't, so I don't tell this tale. But um, Sharkey was the county leader of the Brooklyn Democratic Party uh, years ago, and I interviewed him. He was in his 80s and um, a little hard of hearing, and I said to him, when did you first see Fred Trump? at the FHA. The FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, had financed virtually everything that Fred Trump ever built in the early phase of his career. He they later latched on to Mitchell Lama, which you know well is a, a state subsidy program similar to FHA. And I, so I said to, to um, I said to him, when did you first see Fred at the FHA? And he said, I went to him to Roosevelt's inaugural. And after the inaugural, I went over to the FHA, and Fred was already there. You know, so these guys were living at the trow. You know, they've been living at the trow uh, their whole lives. Explain what you mean by that. Well, you know, everything that they've done was based on political connections and associations. Fred had them unbelievably. Bunny Lindenbaum was his lawyer. Bunny Lindenbaum was the most wired lawyer in New York. He actually had a locker in the basement of City Hall where he would keep a bottle. And if it was an overnight Board of Estimate meeting, which was then the governing body of the City of New York, where they made all the big zoning decisions and dispositions of city property and all that, he kept a bottle in the locker. And the FHA and the Michelama were subsidies? Subsidy programs. Yeah, so these are the things that, uh, you know, that Donald learned at the foot of the master. Fred was a master at this. You know, there were two different <laughs> investigations, one by the State Investigations Commission of New York and one by Congress of the FHA program. And, and Fred figured prominently in national scandals of the misuse of FHA funding. And he figured he was the number one target of the State Investigations Commission for ripping off the Mitchell-Lama program here in New York. And so th they had a long history of this. You, you also talk about the uh, 
the political leaders, Donald Manis and Stanley Friedman, yes. and their role in the rise of Trump as well. Yeah, well, Stanley Friedman became the boss of the Bronx. He was the first deputy mayor under Abe Beam. He was the one who did the legwork. Abe Beam said, anything you want, you got. Stanley Friedman, as the deputy mayor, shepherded right to the last day, on the last day of the Beam administration, Stanley Friedman personally approved the award of the Garden Room, which hangs over 42nd Street, which was unprecedented at the time that they would allow a major hotel to build something literally hanging over a street as prominent as 42nd Street. Very controversial decision done on the final day of the administration. He walks out of the office that day, and the next week, he starts at Roy Cohn's law firm, and Roy was Donald's attorney on the Grand Hyatt, and he goes right as a partner into Roy Cohn's law firm. So, and, and Stanley Friedman ultimately is convicted by Rudy Giuliani, became the most powerful Democratic boss in the state of New York, and did all kinds of things for Donald Trump. Yes, so Donald Manis was the Queens County leader and borough president, whose brother-in-law had a lighting company. When you look at Trump Tower every day on the national news, he did all the lighting in the, in the lobby. Bill Warren is his name. That was the brother-in-law. He used to... Trump would stir up all kinds of business for Donald Manis' brother-in-law. Manis winds up putting a kitchen knife through his chest when Rudy Giuliani and the feds are after him and killing himself. And these are the guys who are absolute linchpins to Donald Trump's early career. They supported him at the Board of Estimate, approving all these projects. Uh, speaking of that unfortunate term, linchpin, what do you know of Fred Trump's involvement with the Ku Klux Klan? Well, you know, I didn't know about that at the time of the book. It's not in the book. Uh, I've read about it since. I can't understand how Donald Trump denies that this is true. These are, I think, Washington Post clips, you know, which clearly say he was involved with the Ku Klux Klan. What I did write about in the book and what I actually wrote about at The Voice in the 70s was the race discrimination case that Richard Nixon's Justice Department brought against Fred and Donald Trump for racially excluding blacks and Latinos in a systematic way with a color-coded system where if a black came in seeking a, an apartment, they got a certain color folder, where if a Latino came in, they got a different color fo uh, folder of where the application was put. The easiest way to exclude people, and, the, you know, the federal government established that during the course of protracted hearings. And ultimately, Fred and Donald settled the case. And Donald does an affidavit in the case in which he claimed that he didn't have anything to do with the actual rentals, personally, actually, rentals of the apartment. But I found and wrote it in The Voice and then examined it a little bit more in the book that he was simultaneously seeking a real estate broker's license in New York State, and that he had to file sworn statements. And then in his sworn statements, he claimed he was in charge of all the rentals of the apartments. So there was a sworn statement saying from him, I don't have anything to do with it, and almost simultaneously a sworn statement saying, I run it. You know, so the racial discrimination pattern at, at uh, Fred Trump developments was really quite extraordinary. He was found guilty. Well, it was, he signed a consent decree. This is a civil lawsuit, and he signed a consent decree. Uh, and uh, he and Donald signed the, the consent decree. And uh, then they violated it. They were not in compliance with it. And they had to go back, the feds did in 78, and do it again a second time. Now, you talk about Trump Towers in the, in, in the new introduction to the book as basically uh, housing for a rogues gallery of felons uh, that's never been really uh, touched upon. Could you expound on that? Well, you know, in the book itself, I added to the list that's in the book. I have a couple dozen felons who wind up getting apartments in, in Trump Tower. In fact, one of the remarkable things about Donald is how he has avoided being indicted in the course of his career. Uh, one of the tales that I tell there 
involves a guy named Robert Hopkins, who was then running the biggest illegal gambling operation in the Bronx and a client of Roy Cohn's. He's one of the early buyers, this guy Robert Hopkins, of, of, apartment, of an apartment in Trump Tower, paid about $2 million for it. And so at the closing, Ted Tia, who you must remember, Juan, he was the city planning commission member from the Bronx, appointed by Stanley Friedman, a, an associate in Roy Cohn's law firm with Stanley Friedman. And he's, he's representing this guy Hopkins at the closing. And uh, Hopkins is sitting there with Trump in the room, mind you, with a briefcase, briefcase filled with cash. This is Donald Trump. Yes. Counting the money out, hundreds of thousands of dollars, paying for the apartment in cash. And, and th he had partial mortgages, which a guy named Robert LaMagra, a semi-wise guy kind of guy, who gets subsequently prosecuted in the Eastern District of New York. Hopkins was under indictment for murder uh, of another mob guy, which that case wound up going nowhere, but he was convicted in in other cases, and, and, and that's just one of the many tenants that were drawn. It was like a magnet for bad guys. Ba baby Doc Duvalier? Uh. <laughs> yes, baby Doc Duvalier is there. Yes, you've got— it. While he was still in office in Haiti, the dictator. No, no well, yes, he started that. See, that's absolutely right. Yes, he was looking at it as a place to dump some of his booty from, from Haiti. He gets an apartment in there. And it's just a long list, an incredibly long list. Joe Wexelbaum, uh, who is an extraordinary side of Donald, he not only has an apartment in Trump Tower, he has one in Trump Plaza, and he's like a several times convicted felon as a cocaine trafficker, and he flew Donald's high rollers down to his casinos in Atlantic City. He's got an apartment there. It's just a laundry list of bad guys drawn to this uh, this uh, temple of greed. Investigative journalist Wayne Barrett wrote for The Village Voice for 37 years and continues to write as an independent reporter. His 1991 biography of Donald Trump was just republished as an e-book with the title Trump, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Deals, The Downfall, The Reinvention. We'll continue with part two, three, and four of our conversation with Wayne Barrett, who's now confined to his home as he battles lung cancer, in the coming days on Democracy Now! So do stay tuned.